I, I went back to when God touched my life when it was in 1996 and I'm sitting on the front row of a meeting and this uh, actually South African pastor came up to me and goes, I brand you with fire. And literally the fire of God went through my body. And for 40 minutes, I, had, I just uh, sat there under the power of God. And after 40 minutes, I said, God, I can't handle this heat anymore. It's too much for me to contain. And as at that time, God spoke to me and he said, start a conference called Planet Shakers. And so we did. And God gave me this picture as, as this man was preaching about fire, how he had an encounter with fire and how I had an encounter with fire. And God gave me this picture of the convergence of fire. And when fires converge, something happens in the spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the first firestorm that ever happened on planet earth in the spirit happened there. And the Bible says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a mighty windstorm and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. Notice that each one of them had a tongue of fire. Each one of them had an encounter with God themselves. You know, you can come to church and still not encounter God. God's looking for a people that each will have an encounter with the fire of God as an individual. Not just as a corporate gathering where God moves, but as individuals. Because God is the God of the, the, the one. But our one comes together with another one and it becomes two. You know, there's a scripture that says one will put a thousand a flight, two will put 10,000 a flight. There's something powerful when you have an encounter with God and I have an encounter with God and we merge our fires, we convert our fires, it, it releases an acceleration in the planet. And that says this, and everyone uh, present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. In, in the New King James Version, it says they are in one place, that when, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they are in one place, in one accord. That word accord means one mind. You know, in our Western society, we are taught to be individual. But in the kingdom of God, God's called us to be not independent, but interdependent. He's called us to not have individual thinking, but free will thinking. What is free will thinking? Free will says I have my own expression, but I choose to come in alignment, into agreement with what God wants to do. And so, you know, the amazing thing about this, our one mind, but think about this, they are from different places, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic groups, different experiences, but they were together in one place. They had one mind. Remember when Jesus walked the earth, thousands of people flocked him. They wanted to touch him, but something happened. He went to the cross, and when people go through challenging times, you really see who's a follower, who's a friend, or who's an acquaintance. And the thousands who wanted to be around Jesus ended up being 120 120. The Bible says that when Jesus walked the earth, you can't even record in the Bible, a book cannot contain how many miracles that Jesus did. So what that says to me, there were a lot of people around him. But when he went to the cross, when it all went the other way and went pear-shaped, all the people that followed him disappeared and there was only 120 left who had one mind, one heart. And they were waiting for the Holy Spirit because Jesus had told them that he was going to go away and he was going to send somebody who represented him and he would, and that he would baptize them in fire. And so there they were, different places, different people, different careers, different backgrounds, but what united them was Jesus. There are people here tonight, uh, today, it's night in Australia, today and you come from different countries Different places in England, different upbringings, different um, education, different socioeconomic situations. But what brings us all together is Jesus. Jesus unites, religion divides. 
And so the first thing that you see in this story is that the fire of God came. I'm believing by the time we walk out of this place that each one of us will experience a encounter with the reckless love of God, the fire of God. See, please don't just turn up to church to do your church thing. Turn up to church to experience the God of the universe who wants you to encounter Him. So the fire came, and I did some research on fire. Do you know fire, for fire to exist, it needs three components. It's called the fire triangle. It needs three components. Firstly, it needs oxygen. Without oxygen, fire cannot burn. And so I begin to think about this with the things of God, the fire of God, the oxygen of the Spirit. What is that? That's the life, the pneuma breath of God who breathes life into things, oxygen into things. We just had a conference, had a, at our Planet Shakers conference, we had a kids conference at the same time, had 1,200 kids registered for our kids conference. The power of God was so strong there that a boy who had been mute for, from birth had never spoken a word, nine years of age, is in this conference and the breath of God, the pneuma of God, the life of God touches him and he says the word daddy for the first time. And then all of a sudden, he makes up for nine years of not talking and he, he doesn't have to learn to talk. He now talks like a normal person and his father and mother are blown away. The pneuma of God, the breath of God. We, have a, we had another kid in that conference who has Tourette's. And now I don't understand everything about Tourette's, but what would happen to this person is they'd be under pressure in a situation and they would swear and they would say words that they wouldn't normally say, but it, it, it was a condition that he had. It wasn't something that he would just do. It was something that, he, that was part of the condition he had. And I, I don't understand everything about it. I'm not a, um, some of you go, well, you know, I, I, I want to blame something, but this kid had a real problem. And, and so he, uh, he was in this meeting. God touched him. And now when he starts feeling pressure, he no longer swears, but he does this. I'm a man of God. I am full of the Spirit of God. I have a destiny and I have a purpose. That's called the breath of God. Only God can do that. So God, for fire to, to work, it needs the breath of God, the, the, the wind of God, the, the oxygen of God, the pneuma of God. Man was made out of the dust and God breathed into man the breath of God. Brings life. Wherever the breath of God is, there's life. The second component you need for fire is heat. Heat. This talks to me of power, Acts 1.8. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's the Holy Spirit who brings the heat. He's the one who brings life. He's the one who brings power. That word power means ability, efficiency, and might. So God brings the power to our lives. I remember as a young kid being insecure, didn't think I could do anything great for God, but I had an encounter with the power of God that changed me forever. God brought His heat. In fact, every time I, I'm in a, in a meeting and I meet people who are anointed of God, I always feel heat. You ever walked into an atmosphere and it's cold and, and it's, like, it's like evil, it's got this cold atmosphere. It, it, you see, the devil is, that's the atmosphere that he has. But when God's in a room, there's heat, there's life. There, there's, and, and so when I meet people, when I write hard bonky, I was with him, I would feel heat when he began to talk. Some of you are in service and you feel heat come upon you and you think it's the lack of air conditioning. But it's in the middle of winter when that happens. That's the presence of God. God manifests himself in, in that way. And so fire needs oxygen, but it needs heat. But the third part of fire to make fire happen is it needs fuel. So God brings the heat, God brings the oxygen, but we bring the fuel. 
So if you study fires and you're a firefighter, that you discover that if we can take one of the three components out, the oxygen, the heat, or the fuel, we stop the fire. Australia is known for its bushfires. It has fires, and one of the big concerns when there's a fire is you have this bushfire happening and, and another bushfire happens over here and they're scared that when they come together what happens is it, it increases intensity and it becomes unstoppable and so they try to take the heat out of the fire that's why they pour water or whatever that is that they pour on it and they try to take the oxygen out of the fire but one of the things they do is a thing called back burning now, back burning is you go to where there's a lot of fuel and you control the burn and you burn up the fuel so when the fire comes and hits that place, it can't go any further because there's no fuel for it to burn. England is known for revivals. You have the Welsh revival, you have the uh, Wesley revival, you have the Whitfield revival. You have all these revivals that happen where God brought his heat, he brought his oxygen, and we brought the fuel. But the problem is when God brings blessing, people get comfortable and they stop the fuel. See, fuel is what we bring. And fuel to us is hunger. Hunger is what attracts God. But the problem with the children of Israel, when they were blessed, they backslid. And the problem is the more blessed you get, the less hungry you get for God many times. Wouldn't it be that a Western church here in Manchester would be hungry with so much blessing? That God would bless us so much that it would make us more hungry less than being less hungry. In other words, we don't become self-dependent. We always come dependent on God. Hunger. I do weddings at times, and uh, I usually get invited to the weddings, but not, not Pastor Glenn. Um, we minister to him afterwards for that um, broken heart. <clears throat> so all of you should invite him to your wedding every time, and you should expect him to come every time. Just... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And all get married on the same day. I have about 20 on the same day. So why didn't you turn up? Uh, just teasing. What was I saying? Weddings. There's this point in the wedding where it says, it quotes scripture, Mark 10, 9. It says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Did you know God has joined us together? The Bible says each joint supplies. So God has put someone with fire next to you so your fire can connect with their fire when what God has joined together, let no man separate. But the problem in, in life is what happens is our fuel gets taken away because the enemy comes and does backburning, which I talked about getting rid of the fuel in our lives. He backburns us with disappointment. He backburns us with discouragement. He backburns us with a whole heap of things that will try to take our hunger away. What God is doing in this church is awesome. But if we turn up the hunger in the church, watch what happens. Hmm. What God has joined together, let no man separate. That means if you've got offended, get over it and deal with it so you don't get separated and have back burning happen in your life and you lose the fuel of hunger for the presence of God and you fill it with bitterness and disappointment. The enemy, the devil, will try to remove any of the components of fire, but he can't remove oxygen and he can't remove heat because God cannot be stopped. The only thing that stops God moving in our lives is our hunger. See, God, the devil doesn't attack God. He attacks you. He attacks you and me with questions. 
did God really say? Have you noticed that with the devil, he takes part truths that make sound like truths. When he said to Eve, did God really say, she couldn't say whether God really said because Adam had been the one who told Eve what God had said. She could only say, well, my husband said that's what God said, but she couldn't say. So the devil had a little opening there because he saw that this woman did not have a personal word from God herself. Hmm. And the enemy comes and says, did God really say? Did he really, does he really want to do this for you? Does he really want to bless you? Does he really want to heal you? Does he really, does he really, does he really? And he tries to separate and bring the hunger down. Hmm. You see... I want to show you what happens when our fires, 120 were in the upper room and their fire came on their fire, they came on their fire, came on their fire and they had separate encounters which then joined together and became a firestorm, a convergence of fire that has still to be put out to this day. The church that was birthed in the book of Acts in the upper room is still alive and well here on planet earth today. See, when fires converge, they become unstoppable. If a fire gains enough momentum, it generates so much heat that it creates its own wind currents and becomes a raging inferno known as a firestorm. Hmm. I'm here to tell you here today, there's thousands in this church and each one of our fires come together. There is nothing that can stop us. As I said, the only thing that stops is our hunger that stops the fire from going. The Welsh revival stopped because people stopped getting hungry. My grandfather was saved in the Welsh revival. At the end of the Welsh revival. And he was a man that decided, I'm not going to let hunger run out in my life. I'm not going to let it stop. I'm going to keep being hungry for God. I'm not going to retire in my older age. I'm going to refire. Because really, we're training for reigning for heaven. And when we get in our 60s and 70s and 80s, it isn't a time to slow down. God never made us to live in retirement. He made us to live in refinement. He made us to live in refiring. And he says, all you're doing is learning how to live at what heaven's going to be like. So keep practicing heaven. Went to India, first five years, he had five decisions for Christ in five years. And four of them didn't stick, so one stuck. What keeps a man or a woman going in hard times and when there's only one person that's a result of your ministry is hunger. You keep hungry. Next 25 years, 20 years he served Jesus in, in in India, then went to Papua New Guinea and bought the baptism of the Holy Spirit to areas of Papua New Guinea. What kept him going was his hunger for God. You know, he was a missionary his whole life and he had no savings at the age of 70. But when he got back, somebody gave him a house because if you look after God's business, he'll look after your family. He used to come to our youth meetings hungry for God. Every altar call where the move of the Spirit was, he'd be the first one there, hungry for God. 86, hungry for God. 90, hungry for God. 92, hungry for God. 96, before he passed away, hungry for God. And some of us are wondering why our children aren't hungry for God. Maybe it's because we've stopped the hunger at home. But when you, have, uh, when you have the convergence of fire, a momentum comes like can't be stopped. But listen, this is what happens when that fire gets so intense. A fire's heat creates a strong updraft of air. Our praise goes up. His presence comes down. Our prayers goes up. His miracles come down. I love this prayer wall. What is this? This is really what this is. Sorry for going into the dark here. But this is a firewall. 
This is a firewall. This is saying, God, we are dependent upon you. God, we are hungry for you. God, we're believing for you. God, we are... See, the needs, God wants to create an updraft over Manchester. He wants to create an updraft, a heavenly environment over your house. He wants to create signs, wonders, and miracles that happen, but it's hunger. Zacchaeus, a tax collector that ripped off everybody, had something in his, in his heart. He had everything money could buy, but he had something missing, and that was a hunger for God. So he positioned himself up in a tree so that Jesus, he could see Jesus, but his hunger, there's crowds all around and Jesus gets attracted to hunger in a tree. Blind Bartimaeus is by the right way so begging. There's a whole heap of beggars. There's lots of crowd around, but he keeps yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd try to quieten his hunger down. And see, the problem is we've allowed people to take our hunger. The woman with Mary, when her brother was raised from the dead, came and poured an expensive offering on Jesus' feet. And the devil again takes half truth. This money could have given, be given to the poor, half truth. And the Bible says it's not that he cared about the poor because he was a thief. See, what happens is when you get hungry for God, there's people who don't like your hunger and so they try to steal from your hunger by putting your hunger down. They'll say things like, oh, I've been in church a long time. People say things like, oh, you'll mature. New Christians come in. You'll mature. We used to be like you. Now... We're more mature. No, you're not. Not you, other churches. No, you're not. You're boring. You're dead. Maturity doesn't mean calming down. Maturity means stirring up. See, when I love Jesus, I love him more today than I did before. That's mature. I've used this illustration before. But the hunger never changes. It just, the, just the journey gets more exciting. When my children were about three, four, five, we had egg hunts at Easter time, Easter egg hunts, and I'd put the egg in obvious places because they were immature, but they were hungry, they were passionate. And they would go walking and they're like, oh, here's an egg. Oh, yes, here's another egg. Here's another, oh, look, my basket is full. Exciting. But if I did that when they were 12, it would have been boring. So I went and hid the mysteries of where the eggs were. So it became a journey. The hunger didn't stop because the hunger took them to places where the immaturity wouldn't have taken them in the past. But now they're seeking out blessings. They're seeking out more. Why? Because their maturity has increased and their hunger has increased. Before they enjoyed it for the joy of it, now they're enjoying it for the joy and the adventure. This is so cool. Listen to this. A fire's heat can, can cause thunderstorms which reproduce lightning strikes that light new fires. When a when a church is so on fire and your fire touches my fire and they converge and there becomes an open heaven and it becomes more intense, it creates its own weather patterns and now thunderstorms are created and there's lightning strikes starting new fires. I call them fire strikes. You know, when God touched me with the presence of God and he says, start a conference called Planet Shakers, Little did I know that literally we were going to touch places in the world that I'd never been to. Fire strikes. What it 
See, we were touching places, you know, on, online. Um, we have 150,000 people watch us online every Sunday. And it's touching nations like we've never known before, touching places. Even when we go into countries and say, hey, we want to help you dis- disciple you. They go, yes, yes, we know Planet Shakers because our children love your worship and they've encountered God. What has happened is it's so intense what God has done. It's created an atmosphere that's touched places and fires have started in places I have never put my foot on that soil or met those people. That's what God wants to do here at Audacious Church and already is doing. He wants to create such an anointing, such an atmosphere, such a power, such faith that it touches nations and you'll turn up and they go, we know about you. We watch you online. We know about you. We encountered God. With the right combination of atmospheric conditions, prayer, worship, generosity, commitment, hunger, fire tornadoes can be created which are unstoppable. With the wind speeds of far greater then 250 kilometers an hour are extremely powerful and they become unstoppable unless you take one of the components out, oxygen, oxygen, heat, or fuel. A few years ago in Australia, there was these bushfires that wiped out 2,000 homes. And I remember hearing the news reports and they said the fire is going so fast that it's at the top of the trees and it's traveling at 300 kilometers an hour and it cannot be stopped unless there's a wind change. (laughs) Wouldn't it be amazing that such is the intensity of hunger in this house that nothing can stop it because we keep fueling our hunger. We keep saying, God, we want more of you. Well, I I don't know if I can make the prayer meeting. Friends, if you're hungry, you position yourself to be there. I don't know if I can give. If you're hungry, you just can't. You you say, well, how can I not give? Oh, well, it's not my personality to praise like that. Who says it's your personality anyway? Which personality are you talking about? Your earthly personality or your heavenly personality? Because your heavenly personality... And see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. What happens is many times we've been put off by people wanting attention. That actually stifles people's hunger because they say, I don't want to be like that. But the problem is you keep looking at them, not him. The leaders will deal with that. Don't worry about that. They will deal with attention seekers. Don't worry about that. But what we got to do is hunger. 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 We win. The problem is once you've won, you, you don't get hungry anymore. But there are other people who haven't won. So your hunger is not just for you. Your hunger, and the problem is if, if a team who a team doesn't keep up its hunger in winning, it starts losing. That's what happens in families. One generation wins, the second generation is blessed on the winning, and the third generation loses its hunger. And we wonder why third generations disappear. Why? Because hunger has been removed from the house. Obed-Edom is there. His name means servant of the wilderness. David turns up with the Ark of the Covenant. Hey, Obed. Yes, yes, king. Yes, king. You're going to have the presence of God in your house. So everything gets blessed in the house. Everything. The news of it just goes around. You hear what's happening in that audacious house? Blessing. Hear the miracles? Blessing. Hear the social justice that's been dealt with? Blessing. You hear about the salvations? Blessing. Have you heard about the miracles? Blessing. They have a prayer wall and each of the prayer needs are getting met. Blessing, blessing, blessing. And then one day, that same knock, hey, we're taking the 
the ark. And he takes it and he could have sat there and said, remember the day where God blessed us? And it would be like a folk tale. It would be like the Welsh Revival. Some of you hear about it, but you have not experienced it. It would be like Wesley Revival. You hear about it, you get motivated about it, but you don't live in it. Why? Because hunger was lost along the way. It became organised instead of organism. It became a process instead of a person. And so hung, so fuel, God's wanting to pour His Spirit out. He's wanting to bring His oxygen and He's wanting to bring His heat, but He can't find any fuel. And so the fire runs out. And so England becomes a secular nation where it used to be the, the missionary sending nation of the world it now became missionaries are sent to you. America the same. Fires a revival. Now missionaries have been sent to America because it's become secularized. Why? Because people have lost their hunger. And God's looking for a people that are so much fuel that when his heat comes. And when His oxygen comes. See, you know why I'm not worried about your nation or my nation being dry? People worry about that. They go, well, it's dry. I said, awesome. Because dry, dry wood and dry stuff burns real quick. So when something real comes and touches it, it releases something amazing. If every one of us got so hungry for God, every dry, broken place in this nation and in the nations would experience an encounter with fire.